going to be asking you guys to be able to do that much. So chapter six, we end up getting four new sets of identities. So sum and difference, double angle, power reducing, and half angle identities. So you have four new sets of identities here. The identity sheet with this on here is in the content library. It's also in the notes for this day. So you can write them down if you want, but there's really no need to do that. So what we're going to be expecting for you guys to do is be able to evaluate sine, cosine, tangent of angles that you would not normally be able to um, find the exact values for using the unit circle. So let's do a couple of examples where we're going to find the exact value of one of these things using these sum and difference formulas. So let's say we wanted to do sine of, um, let's say, 15 degrees. So if I'm going to want to evaluate this with the unit circle using one of my summer difference identities, what I'm going to want to do is find a way to rewrite 15 degrees as either the sum or a difference of two unit circle angles. So I'll go and look at my unit circle. So again, here are my unit circle angles all right in here. Do we see a two angles that could either add or subtract to give us 15 degrees? Sure, you should see lots of them, right? So, so you could do like 45 and 30. You could do 45 and 60. You could do 120 and 35. Really, any pair is going to be fine as long as they add or subtract to be 15 degrees. In this case, it's going to be subtraction, right? Seems clear since 15 degrees is smaller than every value on my unit circle other than zero. Hi, Ellie. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so we'll go back here. So let's, for the sake of argument, say we did thought of 15 as 45 minus 30. Everybody cool? Okay. So we're going to do sine of 45 minus 30. So I'm going to go back to my formula then. So we're going to be using the sum formula for sine. Now notice that this formula has these plus or minuses in it. So this is really two formulas at once. This is the sum formula and this is the difference formula. So the way you read this is whatever sign is in the top or bottom, we use the corresponding sign on the top or bottom. So we're interested in doing this as a difference. So we're going to be using the subtraction symbol there. Is everybody okay with how I'm reading that? So I'm going to do cos I'm going to do sine of 45 times cosine 30 minus cosine 45 sine 30. Everybody okay with how I subbed that in? Just use the formula on the identity sheet, right? Okay. 
Now cos or sine 45, cosine 30, cosine 45, sine 30 are all things I can look up from the unit circle. So sine 45, I find 45 degrees and the y coordinate is root 2 over 2. Cosine of 30 degrees, I find the y coordinate and it is square root 3 over 2. I'm sorry, the x coordinate. Cosine of 45, I find the x coordinate root 2 over 2. Sine 30 degrees, I find the y coordinate, that's 1 half. So all I did was look up those values on the unit circle. So then we'll just multiply. So when you multiply fractions, we just do top to top, bottom with bottom. Root 3 times root 2 is just root 6, and then 2 times 2 is 4. Root 2 times 1 is just root 2, and then 2 times 2 is 4. Everybody okay so far? Notice that these two fractions have a common denominator, so I could write that as a single fraction. But remember, we can't add or subtract unlike radicals. So just writing as root 6 minus root 2 all over 4 is as good as we can do. So that's an example of something I would expect you to be able to do on the exam. Not terribly complicated, right? You have the identities. You don't need to memorize anything. You just need to be able to use the formula. Let's do another one. Sound good? Yeah. So let's say we're going to do tangent of 5 pi over 12. Now the radian ones look like they're worse. They're not really that bad. Here's the trick. The denominator is going to tell me a lot about how I want to break this thing up. If I look at my unit circle, and I look at the radians this time, the denominators for radians could be 2, 3, 4, or 6. Everybody agree with that? Those are the only denominators that appear on the unit circle. So all I need to do is break up this fraction so that the two pieces reduce down to have a denominator of 2, 3, 4, 6. The nice part for the denominator of 12 is anything that reduces is going to reduce down to either denominator of 2, 3, 4, 6, because those are the only factors of 12 anyways. So I just really need to break up 5 over 12 into two fractions, the sum or difference of two fractions that reduce. So what are the ways that I can break up 5? I can do, for addition, I can do 2 plus 3, or I can do 1 plus 5. Everybody agree? 1 and 5, or 1 over 12 and 5 over 12 won't reduce. I'm sorry, 1 over 12 and 1. So, sorry, let me repeat. Backtrack, backtrack, backtrack. So the way to break up 5 is 2 and 3, and then 1 and 4, okay? 1 and 4, 1 over 12 doesn't reduce, so I don't want that one. If I do 2 and 3, 2 over 12, that reduces. 3 over 12, that reduces. That's the way I want to break it up, okay? So if I have one of these fractions, it's in radians, all I want to do is just rewrite it so that the fractions reduce. And I should end up with unit circle stuff. So really, this is pi over 6 plus pi over 4. Okay. So far, so good. So now I go to my identity list. I find the tangent. We're doing the sum version. So I want the symbols that are on top. So it's addition in the numerator, 
and subtraction in the denominator. Since I picked the symbol on top here, I'm going to pick the symbols on top on the right-hand side also. Is that okay with everybody on how we use that? That's maybe the trickiest part. Why did I do that? I wasn't supposed to be in here. I was supposed to stay in this sheet because I had them all written down in here. Mr. Kulik, you dummy. Whatever. So that's going to be tan of pi over 6 plus tan of pi over 4 over 1 minus tan of pi over 6 times tan of pi over 4. So I can go to my unit circle now and look these up. So remember, tangent is y over x. So tan of pi over 6 is going to be 1 half divided by root 3 over 2. Tan of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2 divided by root 2 over 2. Everybody's okay here? So now we can simplify this. So the denominator of 2 can cancel in that fraction, just leaving me with 1 over root 3. The other fraction, root 2 over 2 divided by root 2 over 2, well, if you're dividing one thing by itself, that's just 1, right? Everybody's okay there? So I have 1 over root 3 plus 1 divided by 1 minus 1 over root 3. Everybody's okay here? Now we can simplify this answer a little bit better than this. There's two things that I don't like here. So that one of them is I have fractions inside of a fraction. Don't love that. The second is I have radicals in the denominators of fractions. Don't love that. My suggestion to you is to take care of the fractions inside of fractions first, because sometimes that'll take care of the radicals in the denominator at the same time. Not always, but sometimes it won't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by root 3 over 3. So that's going to distribute. Now it's okay to multiply the top and bottom by root 3 over 3 because it's just 1, man. You know? You can multiply by 1. That doesn't change anything. All right. So when I multiply root 3 to 1 over root 3, that just gives me 1. When I multiply root 3 to 1, that gives me root 3. And then the same kind of thing down here. So no more fractions inside of fractions. That's splendid. But I still have a radical in the denominator. Everybody see that? Do you remember from last year how I deal with a radical in the denominator when there's also addition and subtraction going on in that denominator? Yep, we're going to multiply by something. The problem with that is when it multiplies to the 1, you're going to get a square root of 3 back. 
So that's not it. What we're going to want to use is called the conjugate, which is the same thing as the denominator, but with the opposite sign in the middle. And we're going to think about this now as like a FOIL problem. Okie dokie. So let's FOIL that out. Note here that when I multiply square root 3 times square root 3, I get square root 9, which just is 3. I went ahead and did that simplifying already. That's where the regular old 3s are coming from. When I do square root 3 times square root 3, it gives me square root 9. That's where the regular 3 is coming from. I just did that simplification in my head rather than as a separate step. Okay. Uh, so if I combine some like terms in the numerator, I have 1 plus 3, that's 4. And then root 3 plus root 3 is 2 root 3s. Remember when we add radicals, if they're like radicals, we just add their coefficients, right? We treat it kind of like we would a variable. In the denominator, 3 minus 1 is 2. And then I have a positive root 3 and a negative root 3, which is add to give me 0. Well, we actually can reduce that fraction. Notice in the numerator, both things are divisible by 2. So if I write it as like two separate fractions, that can reduce down to 2 plus root 3. And that's our best answer. So, so did you just change the 4 in the numerator to a 2 and then got rid of the 2 in the denominator? So what I did is instead of writing that as one fraction with yeah. a single denominator, I wrote it as two fractions with the common denominator of 2. So then how did we get rid of the denominator of 2? So those reduced. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah, those reduced. And those reduced. Oh, my fault. That's, right? Yeah, no problem. If you don't see it, say something and we can elaborate. No biggie. Yes. So everybody, this is basically as bad as it would get, right? This is as bad as it gets. Although the trig part is very light, we did have to do a lot of algebra to get our best answer out of that, but it's been a while since we went to the unit circle and retrieved everything. The last few minutes we've just been like, clearing some fractions out and getting rid of radicals in our denominator and yada, yada, yada. Okay. Um, the other thing that we might be asking you to do is to uh, basically go in reverse. So let's say we have like sine 47 times cosine 23 minus cosine 47 times sine 23. Our instructions here ask us to write this as a single trig function. So what I'm going to go do is I'm going to go to my identity sheet. I'm going to think about the 47s like as my x's and the 23s as like my y's. And I'm going to look at my identity sheet for where I see sine x times cosine y minus cosine x times sine y. So if I go back to my identities here, This is what I'm looking for 
and we had the minus there. Everybody see that? So what I'm going to do is just write this as sine x minus sine y. And in this case, my x is 47, and my y is 23. So that's just sine 24, and I'm done. Nothing more to do. <laughs> that's it. We, got, we compressed that down into a single trig function using our angle sum identity. That's not, not, not any bad, right? No biggie. Just doing some subtraction, that right? The hardest part was figuring out which identity we needed to use. And then you do a little subtraction, you're done. No biggie. No biggie. Um, let's do some more. So let's say here we're going to ask you to use the power reducing identities to evaluate. So I'll go and I'll look at my identities again. Um, worth mentioning maybe even before we do that, if I look at 3 pi over 8, I notice that's not even a unit circle angle. So I couldn't even try to do this exactly on my own with just the unit circle. right? I know I'm going to need to use an identity here. But the directions tell me to also. So, so I'm going to go. It says to use a power reducing identity. So I'll look at those. I have sine squared of 3 pi over 8. So this is the identity that I'm going to use. So sine of 3 pi over, or sine squared of 3 pi over 8 is going to be 1 minus cosine of 2 times 3 pi over 8, all over 2. Everybody okay there? So just I found the identity and plugged everything in. If I do 2 times 3 pi over 8, that just reduces down to 3 pi over 4, right? Which is great because 3 pi over 4 is a unit circle angle. If I've done this correctly, I should get a unit circle angle. So I can just go look up cosine of 3 pi over 4 on my unit circle. which is negative root 2 over 2. Negative of a negative just turns into addition. And then the last part I just have to worry about is this fraction inside of a fraction part. So what should I multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by to solve that issue? I think just regular two. Oh, just two. Yep. Oh, yeah, because we want to get rid of the denominator. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we do that. Multiply that two in. So I guess two times one is two. Root two over two times two. The twos cancel. Leaves me with just the root two over four. No more fractions. No radicals in the denominator. That's good. Take it. Not too bad, right? Uh, here's kind of the worst case scenario. Okay, so I have cotangent squared of negative 165. So I'll go back and I'll look at my identities here. 
and I'll go, oh no. If I look at any of these identities, oops. None of them have an identity for cotangent, right? I don't also I also don't have any secants or cosecants. What in the world do I do? Well, what's the relationship between I notice I do have a tangent for the power reducing. What's the relationship between tangent and cotangent? Are they related? Yeah, they are reciprocals, right? Yeah. So I know immediately that the power reducing identity for cotangent is just going to be the reciprocal of the power reducing identity for tangent. Right? I can do the same thing if this was secant or cosecant for any of these kinds of problems. I just write them as reciprocals. Cool? So that's what we're going to do. Um, cosine. Everybody happy there? Just plugged it into the formula. Uh, 2 times negative 165 gives me negative 330. Oh no! If I go to my unit circle, I don't have any negative angles on my unit circle. Whatever should I do? Well, I'm just going to find an angle that's coterminal to this that is on my unit circle. How do we find angles that are coterminal? means the terminal side of their standard position angle is in the same location. Uh, nope. It means we're going to be adding or subtracting, in the case of degrees, 360. And in the case of radians, it would be 2 pi. We're doing, working with degrees in this problem. So should I add or subtract here? Add because I want to have a positive angle measure. So if I just add 360, I end up with 30, right? Negative 330 plus 360 is 30. And 30 degrees is a unit circle angle. So we're good. No big deal. So when I look up cosine of 30 degrees on my unit circle, I get root 3 over 2. Don't love this because of the fractions inside of fractions. What do I do to fix that? Multiply by 2. Okay, multiply by 2 over 2. So 2 times 1 is just 2. And then 2 times root 3 over 2, the 2's cancel, leaving me just with the root 3. Same thing in the denominator. But oh no! I'm left with a radical in the denominator. Uh, well, you can do that. It's not going to get the radical out of the denominator, though, because of the addition and subtraction. Yeah, the trick was we wanted to use the conjugate. We'll multiply by 2 plus oh, yeah, yeah. square root of 3. <laughs> Living up to that nickname, huh? So we'll just foil that out. And again, I'll write out the foils for this because, well, sometimes it's not so obvious. Uh, remember, when we multiply root 3 and root 3, we get root 9, which simplifies down to 3. That's where the 3s are coming from. So in the numerator, uh, 4 plus 3 is 7, and then 2 root 3 plus 2 root 3 is 4 root 3s. Remember, when we add like radicals, 
We're just adding their coefficients. In the denominator, 2 root 3 and negative 2 root 3 just give me 0. And then 4 minus 3 is 1. I don't really need to write a 1 in a denominator. I can just ignore it. So there we go. Is that okay with everybody? That's kind of as bad as that can get. So our last set, we're going to use some half angle identities. So let's say we want to do cosine of 75 degrees. Now you might say, oh, I'll do this as 75 plus, or 75 is 30 plus 45. Not so fast. The directions here are very specific. They want us to use a half angle identity. So let's go back and look at our half angle identities and figure out how to how we need to do that. So I'm needing to use cosine, and 75 needs to be written as something divided by 2. So what divided by 2 gives me 75? 150. How did you find 150 so fast? I just multiplied 75 by 2, right? If you multiply by 2 and then divide by 2 right after, you've done nothing at all, which is what we want. Everybody cool? Okay. So then I can use my half angle identity. So that's going to be plus or minus. Oh, let's write this square root of uh, one min or I'm sorry one plus cosine of u all over two so notice there yes that was the half angle identity that we had looked at just a moment ago So the nice part is cosine of 150 is a unit circle value. I can just go look that up. When I go to the unit circle, cosine of 150 is three, or root 3 over 2. I'm sorry, negative root 3 over 2. Uh, what don't we love about this? Oh, we should do some. Hold on, before we do something first, let's figure out whether the plus or minus here, we need to decide whether this should be positive or negative. So this is how you do that. To figure out whether it's positive or negative, we're going to look at the 75, the original angle in our problem. What quadrant is the terminal side of the standard position angle? of 75 degrees. So initial side is here. So 75 is like there, right? We're in quadrant one. Remember, each quadrant is 90 degrees. We start at the positive x-axis and we go counterclockwise. And in quadrant one, we know all silly turtles crawl, so cosine should be positive or negative in quadrant one. Positive. So we know that this should just be positive. So that's not hard, right? Not a big deal. We just have to remember to do it. 
And we have to remember that we're using the 75 degree angle, not the 150 degree angle. It's the very first angle in the problem. Okay, so we're at root of one plus negative root three over two, all over two. We don't love the fractions inside of fractions. What should we multiply to get rid of that? Close. Nope. Square root of 2 over 2. Why do we need the square root around it? If you want to multiply inside of a square root, it needs to have a square root around it, right? For example, square root 2 times square root 3 is square root 6. Square root 2 times regular 3 is 3 times square root 2. That's why we need the radical around it. Because, Joe, what it's what we can say then is move it all under. Let's write it this way. That allows us to do that. Without the radical there, we can't do that. And now we can do what we normally would. Because we can't take something outside of a radical and do it under the radical. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's just a little subtle distinction. We happy to hear? And we can actually do a little bit better than that. Because remember that the square root of a fraction is the same as the square root of the numerator and the square root of the denominator. And what do you notice about the square root of 4? At just 2. Now, we do need to be a little bit careful here. Notice that when I'm writing these radicals, I'm being very careful that when, if I mean the radical of the whole fraction, that radical is over the entire fraction. And if I'm talking about the numerator, that radical is over just the numerator. Do you guys see the difference there? I can only grade what you write on your paper. So those two things mean different things. We have to be really careful about where, we're, where and how we're writing the radicals on these problems. If you mean the radical, the whole fraction, it's got to be a big radical that covers the denominator. If it just means the numerator, it has to cover just the numerator. Joe. So I have two questions real quick. Sure. So now in the big radical 2 minus square 3 over 4, if mm -hmm. we didn't have a big radical there, we wouldn't, would we still be able to put the radical in front of the 4 and the denominator? No, right? Well, the whole problem, the radical's been over the whole fraction, right? Oh, yeah. Right okay. from the get-go. And it just stays. Yeah. So that part just kind of stays. What I was getting at was when you draw on your sheet of paper, if somehow that radical floats into just the numerator, okay. you know, I'm just cautioning you to be careful because those don't mean the same thing. And one more thing, I'm not sure if you can do this, but like the radical, if you like can't, can the radical cancel out with the square root of 3, so you get 2 minus 3 or not? No. So that. radicals 1, they don't distribute across neg plus and minus. It's only multiplication. Only multiplication can okay. you distribute across. Okay, so then that. And then 2, a radical of a radical doesn't cancel. They don't cancel. Right? You need an exponent to cancel a radical. Okay. Right, oh, like right, squares yeah, cancel square, square roots. Square, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's do one more of these guys, and then we'll uh, call it a day. But this is all the stuff that I'm really going to be asking you guys to be able to do. So let's say we want to do tangent of 9 pi over 8. Again, the instructions are asking us to use a half angle to do this. So I need to rewrite 9 pi over 8 as something divided by 2. As Rami pointed out before, the trick is to just multiply it by 2. So if I multiply 9 pi over 4 or 9 pi over 8 by 2, I'd get like 18 pi over 8 
but that just reduces down to 9 pi over 4. Actually, let's write this as two separate steps. Everybody okay there? Okay. So now let's go look at the half angle identity for tangent to see how we need to plug this in. Whoa. We have three different versions. Does it matter which version you choose? No, but... You can make your life easier by potentially choosing one versus another. So which one do you think would be the easiest one to choose? Which version is going to be the potentially easiest one? Go back to the original one. The original problem is not going to play into my decision making on this, but I'm happy to go oh, back really? and oh, yep, never mind that. and let you look at it again. Oh, I don't. Yeah, I thought the original problem helped you at all. Uh, How do you decide? So the thing that the place where I can save myself some work by choosing is in the simplification part, right? So that's the part that I if by with the choice I make here, I can potentially make the simplification easier at the end, which is what I'm going to try to accomplish here. The worst thing that can happen for me as far as the simplification goes is if I have addition or subtraction of a radical in the denominator, because that means I have to rationalize the denominator, I have to multiply by the conjugate, do all that foiling and all that, right? That's kind of the worst thing that can happen in my simplifying. So the one I'm going to pick is the middle because there's no addition or subtraction in the denominator. I will never have to do multiply by the conjugate if I use that version. Now, it might not matter, right? I could end up with like 1 plus a half or something in the denominator, and that's not a big deal. But if I add 1 plus root 2 over 2 in the denominator, yucko, I'm going to end up having to multiply by the conjugate. Does that make sense? So if I'm doing the tangent version, almost always I would use the middle one. Unless I'm doing like a problem that I wouldn't be asking you guys to do. For what you guys are going to be doing, I would almost always use that version. Where are we here? Come on. So this is going to give me 1 minus cosine of 9 pi over 2, or I'm sorry, over 4, divided by sine of 9 pi over 4. Is that okay? Now, 9 pi over 4 is not on the unit circle. Oh, no. What do I do? I'm going to find an angle that's coterminal to it. How do I do that? I'm going to add or subtract 2 pi in this case oh, yeah. because it's in radians. Should I be adding or subtracting? Correct. 9 over 4 is bigger than 2 pi, so I should certainly be subtracting. So to do that, I'm going to need to make a common denominator. So I end up with 9 pi over 4 minus 8 pi over 4, which is equal to 1 pi over 4. Everybody good with that?
Riley? Yes. Of course. I go to my unit circle, pull the values for cosine pi over 4 and sine pi over 4. And then I am going to, I guess let's worry about the fractions inside of fractions part first. You could technically do all of this in one step, but we have radicals in the denominator, the big denominator, as well as fractions inside of fractions. You could do that all in one step, but let's not. Let's just kind of do it naturally as I would expect you guys to. So let's get rid of the fractions inside of fractions. Everybody okay there? Now we have a radical in the denominator, but it's not addition and subtraction of the radical. So to rationalize this denominator, I just multiply the top and bottom by root 2, and that'll take care of it. Because root 2 times root 2 is root 4, which just simplifies down to 2. Is that okay? But we can still do a little bit better than that. Notice that this will reduce. If I write this as 2 root 2 over 2 minus 2 over 2, that just becomes root 2 minus 1. And that's as good as we can do. Okay there. That's where we'll stop. Um, if you look at the midterm or the exam review, the test six questions are all just basically using these identities to do specific problems, just like the examples we've done. So you don't really need to do anything past, you know, past these kinds of problems. Uh, so there's the problems on the review, and if you're looking for some additional practice, um, you could do 1 through 6, and then 7 through 12, and 23 through 26, and ignore everything else. If you were looking for some more practice, and I did this in the content library, so if you go back and look at the problems in the content library, you'll see the same things highlighted. So that'll, that'll close up Chapter 6 for us. That was all.